So I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to try to read it as fast as I can. Being dyslexic, that may take a while. But I have to read this to you about Swin Cash if you do not know who Swin Cash is. All right. So she's an extremely decorated uh, athlete for her basketball skills. Some examples of her achievements are won three WNBA championships, is a five-time WNBA All-Star team member, is the second player in history to win multiple WNBA All-Star MVP awards, two Olympic gold medals, is one of only six women to have won an NCAA championship, WNBA championship, FIBA world championship, and Olympic gold medal. Experience in broadcasting and journalism as well. Some examples are NBA analyst for ESPN, Olympic broadcaster for 2008 Summer Games, host of MSG Network's Nothing But Kicks, uh, commentator for the first national all-female sports show called We Need to Talk, and that's not enough. She's also a founder of Swin Cash Enterprises LLC and Cash Building Blocks LP, an urban development company that renovates and offers affordable homes to low-income families. Also founder of Cash for Kids, a 501c3 charity with the mission to motivate, educate, and elevate kids. You know, your bio is extremely extensive of, 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 and it's moving. It's moving from, from becoming an athlete and mastering that area. Uh, and we'll get into that. Then philanthropy or philanthropy probably at the same time simultaneously. And then becoming an executive who is, of course, an African-American female uh, executive during a, a crazy time like this. But um, being an athlete and competing all around the world, and uh, where, where did you grow up at? I grew up outside of Pittsburgh in a, in a small town called McKeesport, PA. Mm -hmm. And how was it to be training to go to the Olympics or training to be an athlete? Like, how intense was it? Did you have a childhood? At the end of the day, because, you know, my daughter tried to be an athlete, <laughs> wanted to go to the Olympics to be a figure skater. And after a while, she was like, wait a minute, I need a childhood. I, I mess with this. <laughs> right. You know, it's it's a certain level of discipline um, that goes into every level that you want to achieve. And at a really young age, people don't realize this. I don't talk about it enough. But when I was younger, my goal wasn't to go to the Olympics. Literally, my goal was when we were living in McKeesport Housing Projects was I knew there were scholarships that were out there. So my mom told me at a young age, can't afford to send you to college. So either you're going to get an athletic scholarship or an academic one. So those are the two focuses that I had. So I was training to like go to school. Then once I got to college, it was the next phase where people were like, oh, you're pretty good. You got a shot at going pro or to the Olympics. And then I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. And then there's another level of discipline. So at every stage for me, it was just like, I had, I didn't have the long vision Damon, but I just had those short goals, like every four years, every four years, like where's my life going to be? Yeah, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. You know, they say that when people run marathons, they don't look at the whatever it is, 26 miles. They look at getting to that lamppost, getting to that corner, getting to that. And I think that we often, we often uh, are too busy getting analysis paralysis saying, how am I going to get all this done without just taking the first step? So if if somebody right now is raising a, a child and or they want, let me, there's two ways I want to ask this. If somebody right now desperately wants their children to be an athlete and maybe the child doesn't want to necessarily be one because I joke about my boy Tut. My boy Tut is about five, two, five, three, you know, and he has three boys and he always wants them to be a ball player. And I, I'm like, you know, I'm not the one to say no, it can't happen. But... <laughs> And, you know, he pushes them so hard to be athletes, and we all joke about it, but his love for basketball is so great. Uh, he's a great dad. Um, I think he has four boys, and they're all five, two, whatever. But um, what do you say to the parents right now who are pushing their children to be athletes, and the kids don't want to be athletes? Um, yes. So I would say to the parents, if you want to push your kids to be athletes, push them to be athletes in the here and now not to be pro um, I think there are a lot of different characteristics and things that you can learn from playing sports I think um, you know God rest his soul I think Kobe Bryant was getting heavily involved in the aspect of grassroots and why kids should be playing sports and why it should be fun um, I think I learned a lot of different disciplines and so I would say encourage your kids to play sports because what they learn through sports is going to help them later in business is going to help them in life um, I don't 
I don't agree with parents pushing the whole pro aspects, um, especially for me in the African American community, um, because it's so limited. I don't like that people consistently always think that, you know, your child, because he's tall, they say to my son all the time, Saint is two, will be three soon. And people are like, oh, he's going to be in the NBA. And I'm like, actually, when he was about one, I took him to see Adam Silver. I, I would like if he runs the NBA. So like, right. I think it's the mindset, you know, the mindset for the adults has to change for the kids. Now, on the flip side of it, your kid wants to be an athlete and you don't have the funds. Um, um, what do you do there? Um, find nonprofits. But, find nonprofits. Yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons why I started my nonprofit. And we don't charge kids anything. Um, we try to get them involved in sports by providing, whether it's uniforms, whether it's balls, different things. So they don't, the, the parents don't feel like they're stressed or strapped to have to pay for things. Um, so I would say find nonprofits, find boys and girls clubs, YMCA's, different places that have organized sports for your kids. So I, I think those are, those are excellent points. And I want to get more into a little bit into your mindset of, um, you know, what were the greatest assets you felt that you had as you became a pro? Because we'll see, we'll hear stories that after Kobe or Jordan won the championship, they were back in the gym that night or that morning or that it was always mental. And I'm not an athlete, uh, you know, so I, I have no idea. I know that mentally I go into trying to win and I try to sharpen my, my tools every day as a person in life. What are the, what are the biggest assets that people need to be to, to you know, to want to become an athlete or to be successful as an athlete? For me, it goes back to discipline. Um, it comes back to work ethic. Uh, those two things will take you a long way. Um, I've, I've been on teams. I love team sports because it's made me, I think, a better exec. I think it's made me more well-rounded because you have to, it's not just about you achieving goals, whereas like in tennis and sometimes track, it's the individual goal. Whereas on teams, you have to build and you have to make everybody else around you better in order to succeed. Um, so I think the discipline every day of doing the same routine, the hardest part for me, Damon, was when I retired because I was so used to understanding what my schedule would look like. And now yeah. there's just free time and there's no accountability to anybody. And it's up to you to be able to put that structure in place. I think that's, I think that's a good point because most of us, even though we're not necessarily retired, we're retired because we're in Corona area and we have to be, you know, my, my schedule today is probably busier than ever. I'm, I'm minute by minute, you know, every time and I got to do this. And some people are, are finding themselves in this daze and they don't have motivation because you wake up and you go, is this thing still happening? What the hell? I don't know if I have a job and I'm looking at the news and the world's on fire. So a lot of times I think, I think that is the, the thing that people need to, a body, a body needs to stay in motion. Now, now you, you, you started also, uh, you know, years ago, started broadcasting and things like that. And there's a lot of athletes who are going to hope that they're going to be able to transition into that field of broadcasting after. But we know the reality is with all the athletes in the world, it's going to be half of 1% that can even get in front of the camera. Was that something you wanted to do? Was that something you practiced to do, you tried to do? Or did you just get caught up in it and say, wait a minute, I like that? So I will say this to people. The day I got drafted is the day I start planning for my retirement. And what I mean by that is I knew that for women personally, we had to play 12 months out of the year. Um, so that means we played, we played here in the WNBA, then we went overseas. Um, so what I did was I turned on a lot of money overseas at times because I focused on sometimes in the off season, working for ESPN, working for CBS. Um, and so I was doing two jobs at once. Um, I actually wanted to be like Oprah. I wanted to have a talk show and all these other things, right. but I wanted to stay around the game. So that's how I got into sports and start covering the NBA and men's college basketball, women's college basketball was about, I love the game. I wanted to stay around it and I can go on television and talk about it and, and be able to help people enjoy the game they're watching. Yeah, you know, a lot of times people don't realize I went to acting school only for about six months. And the reason why is because, um, and film school, not just acting school, is that when I would go on to video sets and let's say I, you know, I'm paying good money to put my product on people. But, you know, you know, in, 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 as you know, in the TV world, it's hurry up and wait. And I would see a producer or a director or a stylist say, okay, well, your shirt's over there. It's on that person. And I wouldn't know the lens they're shooting with. So that shirt could look a mile away or the, it could look up close. And, and I'm not going to get my money's worth until that thing is edited 
two months later and I finally see the video. Also, I wanted to know when they were like camera lens or, or breakdown and they were going to change positions, they were going to move for a wide shot or whatever. They would always say five minutes, but then when I started to understand how the cameras worked, that I knew I had an hour to go and do something or come back and talk to people or whatever the case is. I then started to understand the positioning of where the markers were in continuity. And what that did later on is when I went to uh, some, you know, went, went to do a pilot for some stupid show that I thought would never work called Shark Tank, I knew the positioning of the camera and I knew how to address the camera. And that probably was why they kept me initially. And many of the Kevin and Robert already had known how to work the camera. So did Barbara and Cuban. And it was that ability to be able to not waste time, not have the producers and them going, hey, we got to retake that. Hey, look up. Mm -hmm. Hey, do this. Hey, do that. So it's those small seeds of the things that you do. And like you said, you started right when you right when you got drafted, you started thinking about that. And it's those small seeds that would bring you further in. And I'm, I'm going to assume, and maybe I shouldn't because I know you're a brilliant person as well, but I'm assuming that some of that network uh, ability to do that was also the thing that made you an excellent communicator to become an executive in, you know, with the Pelicans. But I don't want to assume. I'm going to ask you, what do you think? How do you, do you think that that led to anything in that area? I think that everything I did um, leading up to not only playing the game, covering the game for, for television, I also, while playing, I was on the executive committee. So I worked and went through two CBA negotiations. So I saw every single aspect of the business. And what happened, Damon, is I would be on television. I'm talking with the guys, um, you know, for, for TNT. And, and I would say to Steve all the time, you know what, if I was on a team, they should be doing X, Y, and Z. And so when I got the phone call and, you know, David Griffin was like, hey, I, I, I'd be interested in you coming down here with us. I was talking to Steve about it. And he's like, well, you talk about it all the time, what you would do. Here's your chance. And it literally paused me for a second because I'm like, dang, you're right. You're right. And, and the reality of it is, is that I had been exposed. Now, my path was different, but I had been exposed to every aspect of the business. So coming into this role as an executive with the Pelicans for me was not so much about I took a traditional route, but I felt like I had the tools to be successful. So I took it upon myself to say, you know what, I'm going to step up to the challenge. And what I don't know, I will learn quickly. But what I do know, I will be able to come in and contribute. So that's fascinating. So tell me about, tell me more about the charitable organization, because, you know, when I have to think about you, I, my mind mm -hmm. just go, you know, championship, you know, athlete, philanthropy, wife, mother, executive. I don't, I don't know how you do it. Uh, you know, so tell me about the philanthropy. How do you have time to do that? I always just had this, like, when you come from humble beginnings for me, it, it was just always important to give back. I think it keeps me grounded. Um, it's important for me to go back to my hometown. It's important for me to serve in the communities that I played in. Because one, we love the fans that come out and support us. And these people don't have to spend their hard-earned money to, to, to cheer for you. But it's important for me to go back to my hometown because they need to see, even though you can achieve success and you can move away, you can go to college, but you still care. Um, and I think I, I, I credit that to my mom, to my family, how I was raised. Um, and it just really has come from, comes from humble beginnings. So trying to give back, making sure these kids see opportunities. Like we take kids, Damon, with my nonprofit, we take them to DC, we take them into Pittsburgh to museums. We expose them to things that for me as a young kid, I wasn't exposed to necessarily. So uh, it's important. I think it's important for our future. And now having a child, it's even more important. No, absolutely. I think the, the best thing my mother did was expose me to other cultures and other things mm -hmm. and showing me that, and that was before social media, obviously, and, and really, you know, the, the images we saw on television of people of color were either athletes or singers, you know, um, and then other than that, there was, there was nothing else that was glorifying, you know, the, the great people of color like, like you and all the people here who are just great people watching that, 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 that they're not on the front line, but they're doing amazing things. So when I started to see people of all colors and or people of color doing great things, um, my, my mind was blown. I wasn't, I wasn't no longer like I'm stuck in this little town or this little area. I can do it if they can do it. So any other parents watching now should be able to say that. So, all right. So the last thing I want to talk about is how is it, how is it being married to Steve? 
so, know well. So Steve is, you know, so everybody knows Steve was an executive over at um, Miller, and, and, and he has his own business, and he wrote an amazing book as well, just like you, and really great guy. You know, funny thing is, with all the product placement, all the things that I've done, and this is just a random fact, um, I, never, I never received a check for, in, in the business, in our business, I never received a check from another person of color who was in power, believe it or not, ever. Besides Steve, the only two wait, there's only three people who ever, who, of color who ever wrote me a check: Theo Ratliff, Steve Canal, and DJ Irie. Wow, that's it in my entire history, and I wrote millions of dollars worth of checks to other people. Why am I saying that? Because people like you and Steve are such giving people, you know, and uh, he didn't see a color. And normally, unfortunately, sometimes when we get to certain positions in life, we want to, we want to work with others and forget who else we yeah. could work with. Mm -hmm. But Steve, when he didn't know me, called me up and, 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 and did that. What makes you guys such giving people who don't have blinders on like, sometimes our people do and it's it's a it's a tough question i know but it is what it is yeah no i mean and thank you for sharing that um I, I obviously i love my husband i think he's amazing and um i think the thing that makes him so great and what makes our marriage so great is that we both care about outwardly making sure other people are good so sometimes we don't even take as much time for ourselves we care about our community um we care about um, our future, our kids. And I think we see the economic impact that is, is so needed and important in our communities, especially communities of color. Um, and so the great thing about it is we both have been exposed around the world to vastly different people. Doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor, doesn't matter if you own a small business, doesn't matter if you're in corporate America. We treat people the same. And I think that's why, you know, I'm amazed whenever I walk into a room with him and he knows X, Y, and he knows like everybody in the room and I'm sitting there, I'm like, <laughs> go Steve. Right. Um, but yes, he's, he's amazing. He's doing great things. And thank you, Damon, for just, you know, just not only your kind words, but also letting people know, you know, when there are other opportunities and businesses out there that they can look to. So definitely my husband asked Steve Canal, you guys go check him out. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, stay safe out there. Keep changing the world. Keep being an absolute uh, inspiration to so many people, inclusive of myself. And uh, uh, I just wish you all the best. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see you in the future when I can give you guys a hug, you know. Yeah. But for right now, I'll just give you a pound, you know, and uh, be safe. Thank you. Go pals and vote, people. <laughs> uh, that's right. Vote. You want the change. You better, you better vote. Get to the polls. Thanks, Dave. Right. Bye.